Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 492. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today is February 23rd, 2019. All right, people, thank you for watching and listening. And we are still recovering from the big computer crash that took down the system the other day. So I don't have the credits up and the titles and the dates. So George and I had to memorize that this is episode 492 and the date. So we're, 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 we were so spoiled. And uh, I'll get us back to that location soon. Also, for people tuning in, we want you to like the program on YouTube or Facebook. Please share this with your friends. You guys are awesome at liking it. You guys are awesome at commenting. You guys are awesome at all these types of things, but you're not awesome at sharing. We know when you're sharing. We t we, I can tell when you're on Anglican Inc. and you click the share button or the Facebook. We know. You guys need to share more. You, get, you need to express your love for the show. We're almost at episode 500. Can you believe that we've been doing this for 500 episodes, George? Oh, well, it's gotten easier as we've gotten more comfortable in doing this For format. Sure. Yeah. I can remember when we started, we would each simultaneously had videotape machines, and we would lean forward, and you would say, now, would you both click the uh, start button so that you could then put them side by side and sync them together that way? Yeah, we were before the, <laughs> before our time. We were, we've were we always tried to lead technology. Um and it's been fun doing that, but yeah, that was a long time. Those are those old Kodak uh, cameras we had that you put yours on a tripod, and nobody, they, there was no monitor on these cameras. So if George bumped his and it was off kilter, or uh, my microphone would come off, we wouldn't know. Here with this Wirecast setup, I know what my audio levels are. I know if George is on camera. I know if he's slouching or leaning. Um, I know the lighting. We have so much more control, but this just wasn't available back then. There was no way to stream from two locations into one format and record it for your uh, viewing pleasure unless I had a satellite, and you guys were not going to fund a satellite truck. I know. I, and that's why I didn't ask. George, let's move on to the news. Uh, for those who've been paying attention, there's a Trouble at Lambeth. And I thought we could talk a little bit about that. Uh, it started a couple days ago when you and I reported that uh, there was a discussion and disagreement and chaos revolving around whether or not the Archbishop of Canterbury was going to invite the gay spouses of gay bishops. And since then, all heck has bro I, I i was called out for using hell the other day all heck uh has broken out and i thought we could talk about this further because when i went to lambda 28 uh i decided as an executive decision to title all the uh videos i put out i titled them the last lambeth it was obvious to me that lambeth as an institution as a organizational structure, as a decision-making structure, quasi as it thinks it is, was not going to work. And this may be very well the last Lambeth. And I remember some people that were very upset with me when I said that. I said, you know, listen, look at this. This is chaos. All they're doing here is talking each other's heads off. And at the time, they called it Ndaba. You sit in these groups, and um, they moderate the group a lot, but you're going to sit down and talk about these topics which are important to you. And Lambeth 110 was the topic of the day. Uh, it, the, it was a mess. Well, um, 2008, uh, this is before Kevin and I started Anglican Unscripted. Yeah. I was uh, writing for various newspapers and magazines, and I was uh, interviewed by Albert Moeller, uh, the Southern Sorry, Baptist yeah. leader, and he had a radio show. I don't know if he does anymore, but I was interviewed after the Lambeth Conference, and one of the arguments I put forward was this was the last Lambeth. And he said, well, why can you say that? And I said, well, uh, what I perceived at Lambeth 2008 was the Delphi technique gone crazy. Now, what is the Delphi technique? Uh, the Delphi technique is something that was created by the Rand Corporation, the California think tank, which is how to essentially manipulate proceedings in an institutional setting where you gather people in small groups, you break them apart from their natural cohorts, you then appoint a moderator who writes down the salient points of the discussion, 
and that moderator then presents the salient points from your group to the wider group. So by the time, so if you have a viewpoint that is strongly held, and the and how they sort of divided up the the the, the teams, you can, if you are a wise administrator, basically quash or quell any meaningful debate or discussion by using these non-direction, indirection techniques called the technically called the Delphi technique. So for example, if 95% of these groups opposed same-sex marriage, the results of Delphi get that to 50-50. Well, let, I'll give you something in 1998. Uh, I wasn't as wise in the ways of the world then, uh, the Anglican world. Uh, the group that was putting together the Lambeth, the Lambeth 110 statement, uh, the secretary of that group was a white South African liberal bishop. And he uh, wrote down the agreed statement, and he tra and, but then he lost it. And then he, from his memory set, transmitted what he thought we agreed to to the committee, uh, the resolutions committee. Well, all hell broke loose because he essentially flipped it on its, he flipped it from the statement that we have today uh, to basically a watered down non statement. Now, that's the Delphi group in Perfectly Done, where you appoint a secretary or moderator, but you can't just wholeheartedly, oh, I lost it. It fell out of my pocket. I'm just going to try to redo it. Um, but, you know, that's, that's my experience of international Anglican affairs, of uh, the Bishop of Johannesburg uh, being a rather dubious character. I think it was Johannesburg, and seeing uh, seeing these games take place. Let's fool the Africans is one of the sort of the mainstays of. Let's use their words in Daba, a tribal gathering where the tribal chiefs gather and they talk and talk until they come to resolution. And let's call our stuff in Daba, but we'll talk and talk and talk to make sure we don't come to a resolution. Well, and so we have all these tra traipsings of uh, political correctness and having the right colored people give the right color, right sounding words. And I hate to, and I guess, Justin, I am a cynic and I guess I should take to heart your words not to be cynical. But my experience of, uh, gosh, going almost 30 years in this Anglican world may have led me to one side of the field. <laughs> Well, let's back up a little and talk about you know, the topic of the day, and that's this Lambeth. And clearly, it's getting bad press. There's a lot of bad decisions. And I want to talk a little bit about the follow-up now to the reality that the Archbishop of Canterbury has decided not to invite uh, same-sex spouses. And I want you to talk a little bit about his personal phone calls and what we've learned about those. Okay, what I want to do is to share the narrative mm -hmm. and then get into commentary because it's so easy for kevin if i start going down a rabbit hole pull me out and we, keep me on the narrative <laughs> will you rule rabbit holes but go for it narrative last year i believe the archbishop of canterbury uh has you know extended invitations to lambeth and made it clear the acna was not coming and they've had occasional puff pieces out of the anglican communion office press office acns where Welby says wonderful things, and he's on video as saying all the spouses are coming. Now, in December of 2018, Archbishop Welby contacted Mary Glasspool and Kevin Robertson. Mary Glasspool's the suffragan of New York, and Robertson's the assistant of Toronto. Both of them are married to partners of the same gender, same sex, and told them that they were not allowed to bring their spouses. Kevin Robertson, according to the Episcopal News Service, in an interview he gave to them, said, Austin Welby said that if you bring your spouse, there will be no Lambeth Conference. So this is in December. And essentially, Mary Glasspool and Kevin Robertson uh, were told to uh, uh, keep, keep your partner at home and keep your profile low. Well, Justin O'Co, uh, excuse Justin. me, Nicholas O'Co, <laughs> in his, I believe it was his January, it could have been a uh, February letter, remarked, had a letter where he condemned Get Lambeth 2020 as essentially being anti-gospel. Uh, 
where its aims, its goals, its methods will be contrary to the words of Jesus Christ and decided the fact that they're going to be gay bishops plus their gay spouses in attendance and we are being asked to uh, tolerate this. Well, that announced that letter of Oko's really didn't generate much buzz because people focused on the it's not a gospel meeting they didn't read all the way through and one of the uh, GAFCON uh, higher-ups basically said to us I can't believe you guys have not jumped on this gay spouses business and this yeah you know we're right because the good stuff was this is anti-gospel so we contacted Lambeth Palace and Lambeth Palace said we don't have any comment talk to the Anglican Communion Office. The Anglican Communion Office said uh, Josiah Dawu Ferron is going to release a statement and that will be all that we're going to say. And the statement came out and the statement was written by a Dawu Ferron in response to Archbishop Oko. And then, then that Friday we had our a report and then on Saturday and Sunday, the press reports started coming out. Uh, it's most Such significantly the, yeah. the, uh, the Sunday Times, mm -hmm. and the Telegraph, and, and then the uh, various news outlets picked up the story. And Josiah Wadava Verone argued that uh, we're going to be faithful to Lambeth 110 and not allow the partnered gay spouses to come because that's not the teaching of the church. I'm going to get into commentary later, so let me. <laughs> so the reactions came. Uh, Steve Knoll penned a piece, which we published on uh, Anglican Inc., as did Phil Ashey, pointing out the hypocrisy and the duplicity and the double-mindedness. And then the Episcopal left chimed in. Gay Jennings, uh, Kevin Robertson, uh, got spoke to at length to ENS and gave the, all the details. Mary Glasspool has kept back from getting involved too heavily and the bishop elect of Maine said look I'm in the consent process I'm not saying a word yes. so I'm Mom is the word yep and Robertson was basically saying you know at one point I thought why should I go if they're going to treat me this way this is just appalling that um, and Mary Glasspool was say, saying that I thought we had passed the point where this would even be an issue and then Gay Jennings Clark, at the meeting of the Executive Council this past week, gave a stemwinder of his speech, just cutting in to Justin Welby for uh, creating two classes of bishops. And, and then we had some other reports. David Virtue ran a story where a former member of the Executive Council, who's a gay activist, said the, you know, uh, the Episcopal Church should go its own way. And Gay Jennings Clark saying we should not have a Lambeth conference until such time as all the gay, all the spouses, are invited. So that's where we are today. That's the facts. Now yeah. let's get into the commentary. And that's I, my and favorite I, part, George. And I think what people really need to hear is that Gafcon and Lambeth, and Lambeth is my word for a Dawu for own Welby and sort of the Church of England. Mm -hmm. uh, institutional church they have completely different views about what the lambeth conference should be doing for just i would argue for, for lambeth right now the key is let's get as many bishops here because that will show gafcon is a is a is a weak puppet and that uh people support in concept justin Welby. yes and so adawa frona says we've had 27 provinces say they're going to send people Oh, there are 40 provinces yeah, and the invitation's been out almost a year <laughs> well um uh, so that and but but then gafcon at this point nigeria uganda rwanda have saying for, as a matter of conscience is our understanding of christian doctrine and discipline we cannot go so gafcon but then there are people like greg venables and tito zavala from the gafcon circle who are going who are saying that we think that we should be there to talk doesn't mean we agree with the people whom we're talking to but we still need to go through uh these efforts so you've got gafcon coming at this from one direction 
where Adaiwa Ferron is playing this as a political contest to defeat Gafka. When, you know, they're not, they're not playing the same game with each other. Well, I think people need to know that Ferron and Oko have the same makeup. They're the frontiersmen. They're the Nigerians. And so they can think their strategy the same. Uh, just that they, they want different outcomes. I, I want to be sure the audience understands that when we talk about this. But I want to look at the state of Lambeth 2020 right now. Lambeth 2008 had boycotters. There was a, a significant amount of bishops who said we're not going to go, and they ended up not going. They didn't. Uh, themselves and their wives stayed home. Lambeth 2020 has a, a proportion of uh, people who are going to boycott, a proportion of people who have not said anything yet, and now a left, a far left, who's threatening to boycott. Why should we go? Um, I, I don't think the Episcopal Church should go if they're not going to have everybody they want there. And when Gay Jennings says, you know, this is horrible, maybe we need uh, two churches, well, this is what was going to happen. This was the warning. This was the tear in the fabric. It's starting to play out in, in bigger, gapping ways. You can't have this dualist idea of sexuality in a church. And, and this is the tear. And see, here's the thing that uh, Gafcon and Gay Jennings Clark are essentially watching the same movie, mm -hmm. which is this is a question of morality and truth, and we need to stand by our convictions. Now, whether you agree with their convictions or not, but they're, sta that they're, they're making the argument based on that. And then you have Lambeth, which is making an argument based on institutional concerns. Lambeth is telling some people, uh, some bishops from the Global South, you can still come to Lambeth and not, and you're doing so, does not mean you support the gay agenda. It does not mean that you're in fellowship with the uh, Assistant Bishop of Toronto. You're just there as part of the wider Christian church. And Lambeth is playing this as not a religious gathering, but as a political gathering, as a sign of unity and strength. Whereas the opponents on the left and the right are saying, unity and strength means nothing unless we're believing in a common Lord. And we don't believe in a common Lord. Mm. And we need to say that, and we need, if, if, if we're going to have a meeting, then we need to have it on the, that understanding that this is not, this is an interfaith gathering. It's not, an, it's not an Anglican gathering. In 1999, 90, sorry, 1998, uh, Lambeth was forced to put on paper a resolution, 110, and said, listen, we'll decide this once and for all, and that's it. Well, lo, lo and behold, tech decides, no, it's not once and for all. So in 28, uh, Rowan Williams had to decide whether or not he was going to invite Gene Robinson. He decided not to. Another slippery slope is occurring for this uh, uh, next Lambeth in 2020. Who gets invited? And I think this is going to be the big juggernaut for Justin Welby uh, in the future. If he can't do this, Gafcon wins. But Gafcon's not always doing this, the, the smart strategy here. Yeah, I mean, if if they wanted to, if they wanted to play the political game, they should all go. And by their numbers, they they'd win overwhelmingly. They wipe it out. Yeah, they just wipe it out. It would be a wipe out. Mm. Um, but because and they're not doing it politically, they don't think in those terms. Well, hold, hold on. The, I want to be fair in this. When I say wipe out, it does not have the current institutions do the follow up. Okay, well, Justin Welby says, listen, I'll enforce this thing against the Episcopal Church. Tell him, no, no, you won't. This is at the primate level. Well, see, Kevin, what I think our viewers need to understand is a bit of the constitutional, structural, ecclesial history involved here. We've never in our history as a branch or denomination or sect, whatever you want to call Anglicanism, we've never had a central statement of what this what it means to be an anglican um and in the 20th century there was attempts to do that we created the lambeth conference which started in 1868 then we had uh primates meetings and then we had 
uh, the Anglican Consultative, the primates meetings came in the early late seventies. The Anglican Consultative Council came in the mid sixties, and then we came up with this idea of the Archbishop of Canterbury being another instrument of communion. Well, what we have seen is every one of these instruments of communion have failed. And the reasons why they have failed, partially due to personalities of those who, a bad Archbishop of Canterbury can screw things up very badly, but partially because the structures that were in artificially imposed on top of Anglicanism don't match the ethos or the way Anglicanism works. I'll give you an example. The primates meeting was touted for a long time, long time, about 20 years, as being the check on Lambeth uh, Lambeth Conference, because the primates would have enhanced responsibility within the communion Lambeth 98 gave them to make sure the problems were taken care of. Well, the problem with the primates meeting is that you have the Scottish Episcopal Church is smaller than a dozen Episcopal dioceses and is probably smaller than the di to Acne Diocese of South Carolina. Yet, I think and, the youth choir in Lagos is bigger than... Well, that, that's, that was actually said to me with a straight face, that the youth group, the cathedral in Lagos, is bigger than the Welsh church or the Scottish Episcopal Church or some of these dying churches that make up the... Uh, in English political history, we had things called rotten boroughs, mm -hmm. where at one time this thriving little town was big enough that it was awarded a seat in Parliament over the course of centuries. It decayed until there were just 12 tenant farmers living on the land owned by, a, owned by the local Lord of the Manor, and the Lord of the Manor basically got to appoint his own member of Parliament who had the same power, rights, and privileges as the member elected by the county. We have rotten boroughs or rotten provinces in the Anglican world. Who have equal say? who have equal say. We yeah. see that in the Episcopal Church. The Diocese of Upper Mission, Michigan, has got seven, eight hundred people. The Diocese of Texas has a hundred thousand. Yet they have the same representation, the same number of, well, so Texas, Texas can afford some assistance, but they have the same diocese and bishops. Mm -hmm. And we have this worldview that Texas has an equal voice to the Peninsula of Upper Michigan. That Niger and Nigeria has 140, I believe, 147 arch uh, bishops and I think 14 archbishops, and you know, an argument is put forward that when Nigeria, Uganda, and Rwanda say we're not coming by themselves, those three, you've seen more than a third of the Anglican world say we're not taking part in a meeting. Oh, but we have six or seven hundred other bishops. Well, when you're a bishop in Scotland of about 500 people. What does it matter? Yeah. I mean, you've got parishes in the United States and Nigeria and uh, that are bigger than Scottish dioceses, for goodness sakes. So the structures are set up on uh, a model of primates. And see, the, the powers of a primate differ. Uh, in some provinces, the primate is the metropolitan. He has authority top to bottom. In the Episcopal Church, you know... It, if you could get in trouble by disagreeing with the primate, I should have been out in my ear 25 years ago. The primate has no authority over a parish, over a diocese, over anything uh, of any significance. So that even if the primates agree upon something, that was pro part of the problem with the whole, you know, given Catherine Jeffrey Shorey an ultimatum, you've got to do this. She had no ability to enforce it. She didn't want to. But even if she had the will to do it, there's nothing she could do to tell Gene Robinson to stop doing what he's doing. And our Anglican world is so diffuse and so non uh, apples and oranges and pears and grapefruits and a few nuts sprinkled in. Uh, Lots of fruits and nuts in the Anglican Lots of fruits. World. Well, it, that you just can't. The, the way that the the smart people in the seventies and eighties and nineties thought that we could come up with a grand Virginia plan that this is how the Anglican world worked. Guess what? It's broken beyond repair. And when you have a bloodless, well, I won't go into first. Yeah, let's not use over Germany and Germans for uh, Justin. But you know, 
Uh, he's in a position now where uh, he can't fix it. He was brought on board to with his little peace initiative to bring all the sides together. And I think that was the desire back then by the people who chose him to be the Archbishop of Canterbury. And he can't do it. We are now to the point where it is completely unfixable. If this goes really bad for Lambeth, um, GAFCON is, you know, certainly for the Anglican Communion as a whole, a wonderful way forward. It has its problems. It also has primate issues and um, some leadership things. We're kind of, we're, we're heading up here, George. I'm looking at like almost half an hour so well, we should let, probably let me, no but let me just because add 10 some. minutes wrapping up a little henry arambi i remember former archbishop of night uganda i remember i want to give two vignettes that i remember from the alexandria meeting in egypt of primates that you and i attended and kevin got lost in the desert uh, but that's not one of the vignettes. <laughs> That's a vignette. <laughs> I can remember, as I can picture this right now in my eyes, I can rem They. it was in a hotel, a seaside hotel in Alexandria, a rather ornate uh, Nasser, you know, era building. Mm -hmm. And some of the primates, I remember Arambi, I remember Greg Venables, I remember Benjamin and Zimbi, uh, and a few others were seated in sofas in one of the uh, common areas and they were all they were having a meeting and what they were doing and they were there for three hours they were praying they were praying they weren't talking they weren't arguing they weren't scratching out pieces of paper they were praying it's trying to discern god's will for the meeting for the church for the world for their lives that I think for me was a, mo a very powerful statement of how Anglicanism can work to see a black man, a brown man, a yellow man, a white man, uh, different cultures, different backgrounds, different everything that's possible to be united in at the foot of the cross in Jesus Christ was a wonderful thing to see. And later we had a conversation with Henry Arambi, I think, uh, Kevin, you remember this? Yeah, I do. That uh, one of the things Henry said, you know, we really need to sit down with Gene Robinson. We, if we, and this is before the word Indaba was trotted out. We really need to sit down with all the players, all the players, and threat and stay in essence locked in a room or in a building until such time as we can come to a common accord or understanding. In other words. Do, he likened it to a Vatican II type thing that takes months, if not years, to set the church on its right course where you can have Henry Arambe face to face with Gene Robinson. We've never had that. No. We always have these things at second, third, and fourth hand. Uh, and in this end center, we have these uh, bureaucrats who, sold, who, who, to my mind, they appear solely concerned with institutional preservation and making sure the thing doesn't collapse on their watch so they kick the ball further down the field well, now we're watching it collapse and there's no way to kick the ball we've hit an end point where the left and the right may very well boycott the next lambeth and see this is also tied even let's take it the home to america it's also tied to the death of denominational brand loyalty hmm. um it, uh, I get nothing from the National Episcopal Church financially. I mean, we, if I wanted to, I could subscribe to some of their stuff. Well, you're going to get a pension soon. But that's because 18% of my income for over 30 years has been socked aside. If you give anybody 18% of your income for 30 mm -hmm. years, you better believe you're getting a pension. No, the, that, that's not where I'm going, Kevin. The, 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 the National Church doesn't really do anything or have any interest or appeal to 99% of the people in the pews. Uh, they want to know Jesus. If they're there for the right reasons, they want to know Jesus and be in fellowship and love with them. And the Episcopal Church as an institution out of New York or out of diocesan office doesn't advance that very far. Now, there are a few bishops historically who have been models of that growth, but 
99% of the work is done at the parish level. And even and in many parishes, even at levels below that, into small groups and fellowships. And with Lambeth's uh, gathering to discuss climate change or mosquito nets or things that are indistinguishable from any other well-meaning NGO conference, what do they have to say to people uh, in their daily lives? They have nothing to offer. If you can't offer the gospel, you're offering the world. And this is the Episcopal Church. This is the uh, Church of England uh, offering the spirit of the age as a solution to everyone's problems. Yeah. Um, I called the uh, Church of England a hoax church yesterday. Hey, the, the Episcopal Church is a hoax church. If you're not giving people the gospel, I, no matter what denomination, to, you know, brand loyalty here, um, you're a hoax. And it's the spirit of the age is not the solution, and we're seeing that. Uh, we're going to set up another uh, uh, conference call with Gavin, George, and I on Monday, and I'm, I want to talk this uh, further out because he offers that English perspective, which will help a lot. And is the, there's synods ending this week too, right, George? Yes. I'm Meeting sure. right now. All right. And if I want to leave anybody with anything, uh, our enemies are not flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. That the spiritual forces of darkness that seek to destroy us and the and the work Christ has given us, it's not it, it's not just Welby, it's not just Sayadaw or Ferone, it's not Gay Jennings Clark, it's not Jack Iker. If whichever side of battle you're on, it's the battle between truth and falsehood, between light and darkness. Yes. And they're, they're that not it's our a enemy. I mean, that's I want to I want to put an exclamation point on what George just said. We don't hate them, and I really doubt that they hate us. We, well, maybe Justin, but you know, th there's that reality that this is about principalities and other things besides the f the, the, the the blood, flesh and blood. I'm Kevin Carlson, and I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 492 of Anglican Unscripted.